Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Yang Tang. I'm a maintainer of Coordinates Project. I'm from OBI, and this is my colleague John from Google. Hi there. I'm John Bellanaric. I'm also a maintainer of CoreDNS and also deeply involved in more Kubernetes. And uh, as Yang said, I'm from Google. Uh, in today's talk, we are going to discuss several things. First, we are going to make a brief introduction about CoreDNS in case uh, not everyone is familiar with CoreDNS. We are also going to provide an update for the past year or so. Uh, and then we are going to discuss about the uh, Community Bridge uh, sponsored by Linux Foundation and the Google Summer Code programs. Uh, the reason we want to emphasize those pro programs are uh, that uh, for the past year or so, we have made tremendous progress, and we have lots of con contribution from different uh, uh, from different school, school students, and they contribute a lot of to coding us. So we think it's worth to mention to uh, to recognize their contribution and uh, give people some insight on what how things going on in those two programs. And finally, uh, after that, we are going to discuss about. Uh, uh, demo plug in Golan, which is a source-based service discovery, which is the focus of this uh, uh, session as well. And at the end, it's going to be Q uh, Q&A session. Thanks, Yang. So what is CoreDNS? Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, CoreDNS is uh, one of the earliest CNCF projects. And um, it's a DNS server written in Go. So you might ask, why do we need a new DNS server? Well, what we found was that uh, traditional DNS servers were really geared towards traditional infrastructure. And um, in cloud environments, cloud native environments, uh, the requirements change very quickly. We have um, a lot of uh, underlying infrastructure services coming and going more quickly than, than you'd want to reload your bind server. And so we saw a need for um, a DNS server that could uh, handle those use cases where the, the, the use cases themselves are evolving quickly and also the underlying um, services and things that we want to look up are, are changing quickly. So uh, this project was started by uh, Meek Gibbon, who uh, I believe was at Google at the time. He's, he's now uh, elsewhere, but um, he's still our, uh, our project lead and uh, our sort of benevolent dictator. Um, and uh, uh, he, he does a great job of leading our community. Um, but over the last few years, CoreDNS has grown really quite dramatically, one, becoming the default DNS server within Kubernetes, which has uh, increased its usage quite a bit, of course, but also by integrating natively with different cloud provider API uh, services. So you can attached to Route 53, you can attach to Azure DNS, you can attach to Cloud DNS, Google Cloud DNS, and you can do all of those in the same process and have it actually serve up records uh, related to all of those things. Um, and there's also a lot of other innovation, innovative sort of features um, involved like, um, or that we've developed like uh, being able to do DNS over gRPC, which uh, folks are using to put their DNS say, on the proxy. There's, there's all kinds of sort of interesting uh, experiments going on. I should say. Well, what are some of those experiments in the last year? So it's been because of COVID, it's been about a year since we've done an actual update uh, to the community. And so uh, it was back in July 2019, we released 1.6.0 and um, more recently uh, 1.7.0 and coming presumably already released by the time uh, you see this. Um, uh, will be the uh, 1.8. In any case, um, through that 1.6 cycle, we added uh, a bunch of more integrations like uh, to cloud providers, Azure and Cloud DNS. We already had Route 53. We added some additional uh, Apple functionality and, um, and, and improvements in the cache to allow you to search tail options. In 1.7, um, we pulled out the Kubernetes Federation plugin, so we have a plugin from the, the original uh, Federation control plugin in Kubernetes, which is um, effectively dead. And uh, so we removed that to, to reduce the service area for problems. And we also added DNS64, which is a plugin for uh, helping with IPv64 uh, transition. Um, the big thing in 1.7, that those of you who, who are familiar with CoreDNS and have been using CoreDNS, uh, need to know about is that 
uh, we changed the metric names. So in previous versions, uh, the metrics names didn't follow the conventions uh, of the, the Prometheus project uh, publishes. And so we revised the metrics names to be consistent with those conventions, which helps uh, fit in with the rest of your metrics. But of course, if you've built dashboards of your old metrics, this is a, a somewhat painful transition. Uh, in the upcoming 1.8 release, probably the biggest, most interesting thing is a little bit under the hood, we have a transfer plugin now. So previously, the zone transfer configuration, transferring zones out, um, was configured on a per backend plugin basis. And now we've uh, built a plugin that handles in all four um, those backend plugins to make it easier for authors of those plugins to support zone transfer. So those are the kind of the major things um, we've done. Of course, there's been hundreds of bug fixes and minor improvements throughout that that last year, but, but those are the big things that are kind of um, user facing and, and visible. Okay, now I'll talk about the coding as community update. For the past year, we have lots of up update from the community. First of all, our number of contributors has been increased from uh, from 150 to all the way to 238 contributors. That's a big thanks to to all the you know all the developers that contribute to coding as. Uh, we also have additional maintainers. Now we have 24 maintainers in the community. We have 30 public adopters. By the way, the public adopter only means if there's a company uh, like enterprise, they use coding as and they're willing to reveal their name, uh, we add their name to the adopters list. But I'm pretty sure that a lot of companies, a lot of uh, enterprise, they're using coding as uh, silently. Uh, by the way, in, in case if your company or enterprise, uh, your institution use coding as and you would like to share your experience with the community, uh, I would like you to uh, to add a pull request to public adopters to increase uh, this number again. And finally, coding has reached the milestone of uh, 6,600 stars. This is a, a gigantic milestone compared with uh, a year ago. And uh, we certainly want more starts down the road. So if you haven't done so, please just click start to code as repo in GitHub. Uh, many people would ask if I have a question, how do I get help from code as community? Uh, there are two sources of uh, uh, two places that's going to help you a lot. That's a GitHub handle, a uh, GitHub. Uh, in GitHub, uh, you should be able to find most of maintainers, and the most of maintainers are very active, and you can find help every day. There is also Slack channel, um, um, CNCF uh, uh, Slack channel. That's a coordinate Slack channel. That's going you are going to find a lot of help as well. There are some additional places you can find, uh, like a website, like a blogs, like a Twitter. Those are all places you can find if you need any help. Uh, next, I'm going to discuss about the Community Bridge program. For anyone that's not familiar with Community Bridge program, this is a program sponsored by Link Foundation. Every year, uh, Link Foundation sponsors at least twice for community community bridge programs for different open source projects. And uh, coding has, has been uh, fortunately enough to be selected uh, to participate for the past two years. Uh, in 2019, uh, one student uh, finished the so-called Google Cloud DNS plugin, which is a very important uh, plugin and is part of the default plugin in coding as repo. And then uh, 2020, another student finish uh, coding and health check on Kubernetes, essentially it allows, it allows the coding to automatically repair itself if there's anything goes wrong with coding itself. So those are the very exciting uh, contribution from the students. And at the end of, at the, end of the day, uh, the community pro, uh, bridge program will sponsor the student. Once the student finish a project, uh, the Link Foundation will pay a stipend to the students. So this is the most financially motivating and uh, it's a very good way to help the open source project, especially for core DNS. As many of you already know, 
Claudine has also participated in Google Sum of Code, and the people are familiar with the Google Sum of Code as well. Uh, for the past four years, Claudine has been participating in Google Sum of Code, uh, and many students participated and contributed to Claudine's project. They are very interested in contribution, things like DNS tab, like uh, uh, ACO, which is access control list plugins, are all part of the default plugin. Uh, and finally, this year, uh, Chanaka, that's a, he is a student from India, he contributed in a, a project, so called machine learning by DNS threat detection. And this project is not a part of the uh, core DNS repo, but it is an interesting external plugin that's a uh, uh, that's actually do very uh, very exciting things. Uh, essentially, the the project uh, the student is doing for machine learning plus core DNS is that uh, many people when they talk about DNS, they say, okay, DNS, yeah, DNS, it's just infrastructure thing. It's not a lot of interesting things. It's not a lot of excitement. But for for this student, he basically build a uh, plugin that allows the core DNS to forward the query to an outside server, and this outside server is essentially using machine learning combined with TensorFlow to decide if a query is malicious or not. And if the query is malicious, the uh, the outside uh, machine learning server will return back to core DNS, say, "Hey, this uh, DNS query needs to be blocked," and then that's. Uh, uh, that complete the whole story, which is very nice. Uh, if if you look into his uh, website, uh, this consists of many components. It has a very good go, uh, very good plugin that's written in Golang. It has a nice UI written in Python Flask, and it also has a, a TensorFlow uh, integration, uh, building a curves model. So those are the excitement that has been introduced by these students. So I think it's worth to mention in uh, in our discussion here because uh, as many people are aware that actually there are a lot of things you can do with DNS if you are a little bit uh, innovative. So that's the thing we want to, to show. The next slide is we, we see that a student even provide a nice UI on the left side. On the right side, that's uh, uh, convoluted neural network model the students use to do the detection. Uh, it's very nice data to see uh, people getting this field to combine the machine learning, combine the DNS infrastructure, and combine the security in place. And also, this student they even have a very nice logo. As you can see, he named this project as ML Bridge. And he has a very nice website, which is a good thing if you have time to you know, browse through. Now we start about a discussion uh, for survey discovery. And the survey discovery discussion is the main focus of this session. When people talk about the DNS, a lot of people raise a question about survey discovery, say, OK, in this day and age, you have uh, SDNs out of the place. You can define a network any way you want. So why is DNS still needed? Or why do you still need DNS? Or why do you need to use DNS for service discovery? I think there are several factors. First of all, DNS is a nice indirection. It may not, uh, it actually allows you to give you a lot of flexibility. For example, if you want to move from one place to another, let's say you have your infrastructure out on Google Cloud. And then one day, maybe you'll say, okay, yeah, because of some uh, user requests, uh, I want to move to AWS. So what are you going to do? Of course, it's going to be very hard to do the migration if you're using the same solutions to make sure that the IPs are the same. But with DNS, it's a lot of time, it's just a simple DNS record change. And you can uh, redirect the user to another cloud or to another place anywhere you want. Uh, the DNS is also a very, uh, very nice distributed system. Uh, it may not be the most sophisticated di uh, distributed system in nature, but it is really scales to internet and it scales really well. Another reason many people use DNS is that DNS is very pervasive in IT infrastructure. And you have DNS in 
in cloud vendors. You have DNS in your Kubernetes cluster. You, all have, you also have DNS with your existing IT infrastructure that's managed by IT admins. And because the DNS is so pervasive, you can easily wire everything up into one place and use DNS as uh, uh, the central source of truth for all the services. And that's why the service discovery has been a nice uh, has been a nice area for DNS to serve on. Thanks, y'all. Um, so before we jump into how we build our source-based service discovery plugin, it helps to have a little bit of a discussion about how queries are resolved within our DNS. So on the left-hand side here, you see uh, a core file. Um, a core file is the basic configuration file for uh, core DNS. And essentially, uh, it, it's a bunch of stanzas. Each stanza has a, a zone and a port, more or less. Um, so what you're seeing there is, uh, for example, organization.com is handled on port 53 by the first stanza. stanza. Onprem.organization.com is handled by the second stanza, and everything else is handled by the third stanza. So the, when a query comes in, off of TCP or UDP port 53. Um, the, the tree on the right kind of describes uh, how that query, the flow that query is gonna go through. So query coming in the top of the flow, uh, it's, it's gonna be routed based upon the configuration of those zones and those stanzas. It can be routed to be handled by a plugin chain, which is defined by a particular stanza. So if we look up food at organization, Dot com. It's going to go to that routing point and it's going to say, okay, food.organization.com, let's make the longest possible match uh, in DNS labels. And of course, our on prem doesn't match. Um, organization.com matches, dot matches, but organization.com is longer. So it's going to get routed into the organization.com plugin chain. It's going to use, um, so it's going to just uh, hit the, the Cache plugin, if it's cached, it'll be sent out, and otherwise it'll be forwarded on to 123.3.4.1, uh, which will actually have a request. Now, anything on prem, meaning this is a sort of uh, uh, anything falling under the on prem organization, so food on prem organization, we get routed to um, that stanza, which would then forward it, and everything else then gets, gets sent through, uh, through, through to the other stanza. Um, so this is how you configure uh, different zones to be handled in, in different ways in a sort of stock vanilla uh, uh, core DNS. Um, so then the question is, um, how do we change that behavior? Well, we change that behavior by creating our own plugin. So it's not going to change the routing, but it can add another layer of routing in this particular case. So um, the demo prop plugin, which is available on our Core DNS um, GitHub organization in the demo repository, um, is a plugin that will return a different result um, based upon uh, the source IP address of the client. And um, in this particular case, um, we look at you know, 172.0 slash 8 and uh, or localhost network and we return uh, 1111, otherwise 8888. Oops, that's the wrong deck. Um, so any plugin in Cordiness is actually pretty simple. Uh, it consists of um, three functions. Well, you can have more, but there's three that you need to have. Um, you need to have an init, um, which is what all it does is actually register the setup function with caddy. So what am I talking about caddy? Well, Core DNS was originally, um, uh, was originally a fork of web server called caddy. Uh, but we, we're no longer a fork. We haven't been for many years. But what we do use is we use caddy's infrastructure. So caddy has, uh, uh, it's a Golang um, web server. And it's, it's got a sort of uh, set of primitives for managing servers, for handling graceful uh, restart, um, for handling the configuration, um, for handling this whole setup process of plugins. And, and so 
um, we use that for some of our infrastructure on the, the, the internal server functionality. And uh, as it happens, one other thing that's, that, that happened in 1.7, I talked about different versions earlier. Um, I believe it was 1.7, or um, well, maybe it was 1.8, but uh, about to happen, is that Caddy has gone on to a version that we don't want to, to, to go with. So we've actually pulled the original Caddy code internally. So that's kind of uh, a, a more under our control now. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to tell the the uh, core file parsing functionality, what to do when it encounters a particular directive that describes your demo, uh, describes your, your plugin. So that's what the init does. It says, here's this function you should call setup. And um, the setup function actually parses then that, that configuration. So like when you set up forward, you say forward dot uh, to some uh, particular server name that is that, that that's what gets passed into this setup function is that dot and then you know essentially all those parameters you pass to it. That gets called once for each time the plugin appears, the directive that you registered with init appears within the core file. Finally, you need uh, a serve DNS method. So the serve DNS method does exactly what, what, what it sounds like. It basically handles a DNS request um, and processes it and basically either processes it, returns the response, or decides that it doesn't want to process it and passes it down the plugin chain. So what do those look like? They're actually this is like maybe less than 20 lines of code. Um, the init function, like I said, super simple, registers the plugin, just says, OK, in our case, our plugin's called demo. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, register demo and the action there is server type DNS is, is because there's also an HTTP server type because it's caddy, like I mentioned. But so that's just always DNS for us. But action is basically the name of the function that should be called, or as a pointer to the function to be called when uh, when you encounter, when the caddy parsing routines encounter that directive demo. So um, the setup function, on the other hand, uh, is passed this caddy controller. That's essentially a pointer into the configuration, a tokenized version of the configuration file. Um, so the c.next consumes the word demo, which is the directive. So we just kind of typically consume that and throw it away. And then we go through and start to look at all the different arms that might have been passed. Um, those could be um, passed directly after it, or they could be passed within the um, within the curly braces it, it, within the core file. So in this case, we don't have any arguments. Um, so we just uh, essentially uh, puke if we come across something that, um, uh, if you added arguments there. Then we add this plugin in the setup. We add this plugin to the chain. So essentially, we're saying, um, here's the, the, the handler, uh, here's, here's the the handler to call um, when uh, when a query comes in and it's going down and trying to process it. Um, here's the one that the previous plugin should call in the event that it doesn't want to handle this particular request. So finally, then serve DNS. This is the meat of it. This is this is what gets called when um, by that that chain when. Um, when a request needs to be handled by this particular plugin, um, just does a few things. One, it creates this sort of convenience um, struct called a we call state. It's a request object, um, and pulls the uh, the query name off of that. That's what name does. Um, since we are sort of uh, brain dead, we don't allow you to configure it. We just hard coded eight 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 here, um, and then we just look at the the state.ip, that's the client's uh, source IP. And if it starts with, with one of these things, um, we, we reply with something different and we log it. So um, obviously, this is not a very useful plugin because um, that, that's not an answer we want, typically. But um, normally, a plugin would examine the, the type of the query, uh, would potentially look it up, or it might manipulate it in some way. Finally, we the final piece to making all this work is that we need an actual core file. Um, when we create, uh, we need to call it within core file. It's super simple. Um, 
The plugin doesn't get inserted into the chain until it sees that directive we talked about earlier. The directive we put in was demo, so we have to put that into the core file in order to see it work. Um, finally, building it. So one interesting thing, interesting meant in a somewhat pejorative way, because I, I don't particularly like this, but it's just how it is right now, is that, uh, that plugins cannot be loaded at runtime. Plugins are only loaded, uh, only built, uh, done at build time. So we have to actually go in, there's a file called plugin.cfg, and that file has, has an ordered list of plugins. And in fact, not only can they, they, they not be loaded, because right, it's Go, it's statically compiled, but they actually uh, can't be reordered. Um, that's actually my bigger complaint, not so much that, they, that we need to recompile, because uh, I like statically compiled things, but, um, but that we can't reorder. So that's my, uh, my, uh, my, my little side comment there. Maybe we'll fix that one day. We haven't done it yet. Um, but nonetheless, you need to go in and decide where do you want this to fall. So that means that, um, for example, the forward plugin comes very late in the plugin.cfg file because typically we don't want to forward something until we've had given an opportunity for, uh, say, the Kubernetes plugin or the file plugin to, to handle the query first. So um, similarly, things that um, like um, uh, rewrite. Rewrite comes very early in the plugin chain because rewrite takes the request, modifies it, hands it down the chain for, for other things, and then it's given an opportunity to, um, to, to do something more with it on the, on, with the response on the way out. So you have to make a decision about where your plugin should fit. In this case, well, we are doing a source-based service discovery. We're actually, um, we're actually essentially a backend. We're deciding what to return uh, based upon the query. And so, um, and given that we want this to sort of take priority over what might be in a file or might be on some DNS server out there, we want to put this early in the plugin chain. So we would go into plugin CFG and we would drop it in um, uh, somewhere early in there. Um, and then um, finally, we just build. There's a nice Docker command you can use to build, so you don't need to have Go, Go installed locally. And it, it creates the file for you, and, and, and you can run. So we don't have a live demo for you today, but what we do have is a, a link to the source code. So you can just click on that or uh, visit that in GitHub and um, take a look at what, what, what it is and, and give it a try. And uh, um, after that, uh, feel free to reach out to us on some of the channels that Yang mentioned earlier on Slack or wherever it may be if you, if you run into trouble. Thank you. Uh, oops. Um, finally, uh, once you've written that demo plugin and worked it and it's working great, and you realize you've got all these crazy use cases that you want to do, then please join us and become a contributor. Um, you know, we um, th th there's there's lightweight ways like like uh, help to help out the project, like you know, I mentioned, star us or uh, if you if you use um, CordyNS, which if you use Kubernetes, you probably use CordyNS, even if you don't know it. Um, feel free to uh, add yourself to the adopters or jump in on our, our GitHub or Slack channels. Um, we, uh, you know, if you if you show good judgment, write good code, and you, and you give us a good solid PR, um, you know, you, you'd be a contributor. And if you do one that, uh, that requires um, potentially ongoing maintenance, then we'll want you to be a maintainer, especially if you add a plugin. Um, uh, because, you know, it, Many hands make light work um, when when there are changes that come in uh, or problems with a particular plugin. We like to have the author of that um, be a maintainer of it uh, in, in the vast majority of cases. So um, would love to have you have you uh, take your new skills and and contribute there. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll look forward to the Q and A.